Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining. Uh, my name is Massey. I'm here to talk to you about indexing the planet uh, for good. Uh, a bit of background about myself. I'm a graduate of the University of St. Andrews, which is a small university in Scotland. I've been at PL for uh, just over two years now, primarily working on content routing problems. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, we're going to talk about what it is that we're indexing, this content indexing itself. Uh, what challenges we came across and what, what, are the, what were the things that we needed from an index system that we were building and walk you through the IPNI protocol itself. Um, Dennis did an excellent job of just laying out how all these pieces fit together and I'm here to kind of dive a bit deeper into the IPNI protocol itself and talk about um, how it scales the way it scales. Indexing what? What is it that you index? Well, content. You hear this word coming up a lot. Uh, content could be anything, but what sort of content are we talking about? We're talking about addressable content. Uh, what is addressable content? Well, addressable content is immutable, uh, it is independently verifiable, and it's identifiable. Um, and its IDs look a bit like this. Uh, so essentially, we're talking about chunks of bytes that are hashed with some uh, metadata in front of it, but essentially, all you have is just hashes. Why do we want to do indexing anyway? Well, obviously we want to do lookup, right? Given, given a hash, we want to find out who has it. Uh, but in this case, we want to do more than lookup. We want to build a lookup system that's actually extensible. What does extensibility mean? Lookup traditionally basically maps a hash into a set of addresses. What we really want is to build a system that helps us not only map addresses, but also shift decision making to the application level or shift things to the left, so, if you like. Uh, we want to enable applications that are um, richer. We want to enable applications to make decisions on their own about their own, their own trade-offs. And that essentially means we need to create an indexing system that not only gives you addresses, but also gives you other information that helps you as an application developer, as a protocol developer, make better decisions about the things that you care about. Uh, and these things include things like retrieval protocols. The thing that I'm looking up what protocols over which I can retrieve it, because it matters if I'm connecting from mobile or if I'm connecting from desktop, for example. What were the semantics for storing the information? If the information was stored in a certain way, maybe I can look up other mirrors for the data, or maybe I can do some other uh, proving of, of sorts, for example. So this is the sort of direction that we're going with the indexing. Let's take a step back and think about how much data is out there anyway. Uh, I found this um, diagram online. It is a study of the amount of data created by humans with some projections for the next two years. Uh, the absolute numbers really don't matter here. The thing that I want to point out is the trend. We are, we are looking at an ex exponentially growing amount of data in the planet that we love and live in, right? Uh, now, what does it look like if this was content addressable? It's going to look a bit like this, right? That is a lot of hashes. It's, it's really hard to make sense of. So we're talking about an indexing system that's got to cope with a humongous amount of hashes. But coping with hashes is not enough. This is data. This is data that evolves, changes all the time, moves from one system to another. So looking up alone is not enough. The indexing system should also cope with this evolution of data. So what is it that we want from an indexing system? Above all, we want the indexing system to be fast because it is the entry point to all the other systems that we are typically building, and it's the slowest affects everything. We want it to be scalable to cope with this, this massively growing amount of data, and we want the index to be inexpensive to change because we know for sure the data evolves, the data changes, things get added, things get removed, things get uh, re-encoded. And we also want, it, want the index to be contextually rich because we want to shift things to the left, remember. So if I want to sum it up, the sort of indexing that we want should reduce barriers for entry, but at the same time, it should not enable another Google Analytics to be created around it. Right? That is the fundamental challenge that we are talking about here. Uh, Dennis covered this already. Well, why not DHT? Let's just use a DHT, right? So DHTs typically are made of heterogeneous nodes that have different roles, different sizes, and so on. And it's difficult to make this type of network performant, the sort of performant that we want, which is not only to match Web2 world, but also uh, blow it out of the park. Uh, but there's a better reason for, it, uh, um, for not using DHTs. 
the amount of data that we want to index is humongous. If you think about the number of routing records that have to exist on a network of, say, 20,000, which so happens to be the uh, network that, uh, DHC network that IPFS uses, for example, we're talking about hundreds of gigabytes worth of information that has to be stored on each node. So this is just typically, it's not feasible for me running a DHC node on my laptop on the way to work on the train. I, I do not want to store that much information on the DHC, right? So for the DHC to work, the very first thing that we want is far bigger networks, which we do not have today. This is where uh, IPNI comes in. So IPNI takes a step back, move, moves a bit towards centralization. It makes a bet on storage. We're talking about systems that are um, using more uh, disks. They have more disks attached. Disks are getting cheaper. It uses a federated sort of uh, a network, and it heavily utilizes edge caching, uh, caching on the edge where the requests come from to make the lookups as fast as possible and reduce load on the backing service that does ingestion and so on. This is an overview of the IPNI protocol uh, itself. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to go a little bit deep here. Uh, this is, um, I, I will go on each stages, but the main thing that I want to point out here is uh, roles of different, uh, different entities in the network. So we have uh, index providers. Uh, their job is to basically create a catalog of uh, information. Uh, the catalog of information is represented as a DAG. Uh, this information itself is immutable. You can see the advertisements. You can see the entries on the, on the picture. Um, the, the key thing to point out here is that advertisements only capture differentiation in the catalog of information. So every time in IPNI you want to say, I have a hash, you only publish it once and say, I have a hash. And then next time you want to say, actually, I don't have any of the hashes that I told you, it takes a very small message to then convey that to the network. And the way that it works is that IPNI provides a concept called context ID. It is a way by which you can group information together, and rather than having to tell the network uh, hashes every time you want to add or remove them, you simply refer to that uh, pointer in time. right? Um, there, there is another concept here, which is uh, chain level changes and uh, um, context ID level changes, if you like. Uh, so you can imagine, uh, as, an, as a content provider, I may have um, a database of contents, and I may have a server that is serving that information over HTTP. Tomorrow, I implement my own retrieval protocol, which is much better than HTTP. Its name is you know, like HTTP 3000, whatever you like. This is a totally new protocol, right? What IPNI allows you to do is to add, add contextual information on top of the advertisements that you've published already to convey new capabilities or to take new capabilities, uh, to, to uh, take added capabilities away. And those are very small messages because of this concept of chain level changes. So, um, you can publish an advertisement that, for example, doesn't have a context ID, and essentially the content of that advertisement means it's, the changes in it apply to all the content that you have published in the past. Uh, in terms of um, immutability of the um, advertisement chain itself, uh, one thing to point out is that this structure itself could be used to then keep providers accountable, because each of the advertisements are signed, so you can go back and say, hey, you told me that you have this, and there hasn't been any removal advertisement. So you could start to think about how could you build things like incentive protocols? How could you build things like, uh, for example, validation, retrieval validation protocol? Because if you, have, if you just have a system that just takes uh, key values, it is you know, easy to topple that by just garbage information, right? So this, is this sort of uh, structure of information, this chaining of the information, then allows you to build many, many different systems. So I'm going to uh, walk through each of the stages of the protocol. Um, I want to leave more, qu more time to them for questions. So let's first talk about the first thing that uh, happens, right? So the first thing that happens after the index provider has curated this um, catalog of information is the index provider simply announces to the network that, hey, I have something new. I want to be explicit about this something, right? I want to show you an example of what this announcement looks like. This is the body of announcement that we're talking about here. This is a tiny message. The only thing that it has in it is the link to the latest entry in the advertisement chain. 
It actually doesn't have much data apart from that. The public key is optional. You know, it could be retrieved from alternative ways. All we are really talking about here is, as a provider, I have a head, and uh, I signed it so you know it's me. There is something new. Then what happens is, indexer goes and pulls the data. Uh, what does the fetching look like, right? The fetching looks a bit like this. So the indexer goes and fetches the information from the index provider at its own leisure. Right? Now I want to go back and show you. Oh, I want to go back and show you this uh, structure again. Remember, advertisement chain and entries are immutable. This is a DAG. Right? I may publish an advertisement with different detail that uses the same list of entries, i.e., list of hashes. And I may be reusing links here, right? You can imagine I may be reusing the links here. So this fundamental design decision that indexers go and pull information enables indexers to be super efficient when they interact with peers because they can first of all reach the indexers as their own, uh, reach the providers at their own leisure, depending on what the traffic is on the on the indexer. And second of all, they could be very efficient. They, they could remember what it is that they have seen already because all the data is immutable and just uh, not get it if they have seen it already by alternative sources. So the information that the uh, indexer fetches, you can see on the right hand side, there's an example of it. Um, uh, that's the context ID that I'm talking about. The context ID is nothing by, uh, but an arbitrary ar array of bytes. It makes no assumptions about the protocol, nothing. It is entirely up to the provider to decide what it is. The only thing that is, used, that is useful by the indexers is grouping and that bulk removal and bulk interaction without having to replay all the entries every time. Right? Uh, by the way, I think Dennis mentioned this already in, in IPNI. The big difference between IPNI and DHT is that you don't need to republish stuff. All you need to do in order to make sure your content remains um, retrievable is that you need to be uh, reachable as an index provider. You don't need to republish anything, everything. Right. So that's, that's also another uh, advantage. Indexers also fetch entries, and this is what the entries look like. The entries are essentially an uh, array of linked lists that contain hashes. There's nothing complicated here with a link to next, and then when the next is nil, you know that you have traversed all the links. Uh, it's all very simple. Then what happens, uh, the magic happens inside the indexer, which is ingestion. Right. So what you see here is a logical view of what the, in, what the indexing looks like. But actually, on disk, it all turns into encrypted records, which is completely decipherable even by the indexer itself. And the logical view maps the hashes, or as you can see here, multi-hashes. You can just interchangeably think of hashes here. Uh, maps the hashes to a value key, which is essentially a yeah, if, you, if you think of the RDB, um, RDBMS days, it, this is essentially a foreign key, right? Essentially a foreign key to a record that then has provider record information and whatever metadata that they mentioned, right? So metadata, context, all of that goes into that record, and this value key is just pointers to it. And each multi-hash may be provided by many, many providers, so you, ha you just have a lot of foreign keys. And all of this is represented in just vanilla key value store. And then indexer, what it, uh, what it does is that it encrypts this information uh, via a technique called double hashing, uh, which means if you know the original hash that you're looking for, you can decrypt everything. But if you don't know the hash, essentially you're looking at random data at key value, key value, key value, key value. Uh, this talk is um, too short to go into details in terms of how the encryption works. Uh, there are links on the slides. Please uh, go have a look at at their specifications, but uh, I'm happy to go through it in um, uh, offline. So, so far we ended up with uh, curating the content, uh, announcing it to the network, fetching it by the indexer, creating this logical view, which actually on disk is completely encrypted, and even indexers don't know what hashes exist, and then the lookup happens. The lookup simply is a REST interface that allows you to, given a, given a content ID or CID, um, um, hash, you look up the information about the provider. The information that you look up contains context ID that I talked about, contains things like metadata, which embeds things like what protocols over which the data is retrievable, as well as um, extra addresses you know, from which endpoints I can, I can retrieve stuff. The, uh, the output that you can see here is a lookup response from a query that was not encrypted. Uh, because to, to make the encryption work end-to-end, -end, the client also needs to do some work, needs to encrypt records. 
So what we have here is a thin service that does the encryption on behalf of the client for the clients that haven't upgraded yet, but we hope that eventually all the clients um, upgrade slowly and we have, uh, you know, we only serve encrypted information and this is the encrypted information. This is what it looks like. You essentially get an encrypted record and you get, uh, sorry, an encrypted hash and you just get an encrypted row. As long as you know the original hash, you can decrypt everything that makes sense of it. So let's have a quick overview of what are the key features of the RPNI protocol. Uh, the pool model has really worked out for us. It, it made a massive difference. The bulk operations are a game changer, so it allows you to uh, perform actions without having to replay all the hashes every time, uh, as well as uh, going republication, completely going away. Uh, separation between chain level and um, you know, the advertisement level uh, made a lot of sense for us because the retrieval protocols and the context itself changes all the time. So that allows you to change the contextual richness of your advertisement without having to replay all the indexes. And there's a concept of extended providers, for example, that allows you to create um, endpoints over which the data could be uh, retrieved without having to publish stuff. This is a practical example of extending the contextual information. And metadata itself could be arbitrary bytes, and the uh, privacy stuff that I talked about is a concept called reader privacy. Uh, today, we are ingesting about 3 billion hashes per day. This is all happening on sit.contact. Uh, this whole service is about a year and a half old. Uh, it's just amazing how far uh, along it has come. Its um, index is 32% of the Filecoin data, which is a total of about uh, 500 petabytes of data, petabytes of data, which is staggering. Uh, as Dennis mentioned, we only have about 700 providers. Most of these are big boys. These are providers that provide huge amount of data. And IPNI is integrated as a default router in Kubo since version uh, 0.18, uh, which was released early uh, January. I wanted to uh, show you quickly the uh, topology of SID.contact. Um, we are heavily using caching, for example, to make sure things go fast. Uh, we also provide services like cascading lookup of our alternative routing systems to really create a one-shop um, stop for looking up everything. Um, and uh, the response we get from clients is amazing. Everybody, everybody likes it. You can see um, uh, like indications of uh, things like Federation, for example, the assigner service, um, which I'll, I'll go in, uh, I can't go into now, but uh, happy to discuss further. So what are we working on right now? Uh, we are working on a federation protocol that uh, expands this sort of mini federation that we have on our local cluster across uh, data centers. We're working out on the protocol details of this. We are working at um, what other primitives or information we need to expose to the network uh, to create um, things like um, a domain for creating new um, uh, validation protocols like retrieval incentives, for example. And uh, we are working on the other side of the privacy, which is uh, so far we talked about how the server stores information such that it can't snoop on its users. Uh, what we want to, uh, what we're going to work on next is actually how we encrypt the entire index provider, such that index provider, all, uh, the information that comes out of index provider is also completely uh, decipherable. And thank you so much for listening. Um, there's a bunch of links there you can uh, have a look, and please, if you have any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, thanks a lot for the talk, especially the reader privacy. That technique is really um, mind blowing. Uh, you mentioned a lot about advertisements, and uh, if in this stack that you are uh, working, where do you see the advertisement targeting fits, and how one can add privacy there? Uh, so th that's where the writer privacy comes in, right? So, so far we're talking about reader privacy, which is after advertisements have been ingested, how do we store them such that even the indexer can't uh, snoop over, snoop on their users, right? So the writer privacy, this, the sort of ideas that we have is you can think of this as the reverse of uh, reader privacy. So what you get back is a list of basically random uh, entries from a provider. Uh, we're just working on the details of that to, to basically hopefully make it available. Um, like the lookup path for reader privacy, this requires changes on the index provider side, requires code changes, so it's a bit harder to roll out, whereas the stuff that we're talking about here is changes on the server side, which is 
pretty easy to roll out. So uh, once that, please watch the IPNI spec repo for uh, updates. Thank you. Are there, there is one more question here. Hi, thanks, Marcy. Great talk. Um, do you actually have a specialized um, key value store in, in the back of, of IPNI? Great question. So let me show you the topology. So, oop, I keep. Yeah, that's it. So we started with our own implementation of a uh, key value store, uh, but we quickly grew out of it. Uh, what the deployment that you see here, it is highly optimized uh, to give us the sort of performance that we were looking for. We are actually using a key value store called Pebble, uh, which, is, which some of you might have heard of. It is a key value store used by a system called CockroachDB. Uh, the way that we are using that is quite novel in that it will, we, we store information such that when the records need to change, we don't need to read the entire record back. Uh, so we are using a feature in Pebble called merge function. Uh, if you can imagine, we have hashes that may have multiple providers in them. Uh, so every time a new provider adds, adds to a hash, a typical thing to do is to you read the record, you update the list of providers, and then you write it back, right? Um, and that just wasn't performant enough for us. So what we have created is a custom merger, which doesn't change, the, doesn't read the data back. It just um, merges values to it, and then opportunistically sorts the list of providers in for the record to then make speed up the uh, lookup. Uh, the setup that we have right now actually uses uh, six different instances of um, um, uh, Pebble uh, backing stores, uh, which are uh, load balanced across, uh, and it's, we find it to be really maintenance free. Like since since we figured out all the uh, wrinkles and so on, it's, it's been running fine, and you know we are, we are happy with the availability. Uh, so that's that's where. That's, that's why we're looking for things like federation and folks that are interested in running one of these instances, so that we can decentralize the whole thing. There is another question. Uh, so between using Pebble and uh, double encrypting, oh, double hashing rather the the keys, that means that there is only one key by which you can uh, look things up natively, right? Uh, are you looking to add um, uh, supplementary structures for lookup by user keys? Absolutely. So the, a nice thing about double hashing is that it makes the, con, uh, makes the load balancing using constant hashing straightforward because you're only talking about just regular key values. You don't need to update the values. The, what happened in the past was we had a, a Pebble store which would write to, which we would write to, and this Pebble store eventually fill up, so up to 16 terabytes. And then we would stand up a new instance and point the uh, ingestion traffic to it. Now, that traffic that is coming through might have a hash, which is already exists in the other database, but the other database is already full. It's on, on the read mode, right? So essentially, what that means is that you can't do the uh, consistent hashing load balancing. What you really have to do is just scatter gather. Just ask everybody for the thing and then come back. It's sort of okay because you know, everything is uh, on over essentially local network, so it's fine. But with the double hashing, we could be much, much, much more efficient because we get a unique key for each of the uh, multi-hashes since it is encrypted by nuance and information from the provider. Uh, so what we are looking at now is basically changing all of that such that lookup would even would be even faster. Uh, we don't know if it would render things like edge caching to some extent redundant, but uh, I think that it would make a big difference in terms of uh, lookup latency. Well, if there aren't any further questions, then thanks a lot again. Thank you so much.